Well, good morning, everybody. Sure miss seeing your faces physically, but grateful that we can be together digitally through our online services. Welcome to everyone joining us from all around this time of year. Lots of traveling going on, so trust you're having some safe journeys on the roadways. And as we press into the latter part of July, I know parents, your inbox is being filled with mostly an update from the school that's um, a change to the previous update. So the routine has been, we're just going to adjust and adapt. So prayers go out and gratitude goes out to everybody in leadership positions all around our community, but especially in our school system. Thank you to our administrators and our teachers and all of those who are spending an an abundant amount of hours trying to figure out how to bring kids back to school. So we're praying for you. We're with you. We stand behind you. And And I also want to just say thank you to everyone, a part of the Eagle family. You guys have been so gracious, so supportive, so helpful. My inbox has been steadily filled with uh, outreaches from you guys. So thank you for your words, your prayers, your support, um, your generosity. Financially, you continue to give and help. And and we want to be that kind of a body where uh, if you're in a place and you're tuning in this morning and you need some help, uh, we want to be a place where you can get help. And, uh, and so you just send an email to help at eaglechurch.com. If there's some, you need prayer, you need some help with food, uh, you just need some uh, relationship, companionship, you need some counseling help, we want to be a place to help. And then there's also a place if you want to give help. So, so many of you have been so generous. So thank you for helping us be that place to give help and get help. Believe it or not, do you know that today is the 18th Sunday that we've been together, not physically but digitally. So, is anybody else counting? Does it feel like 18 weeks or does it feel like 18 months? Maybe type in the chat room, 18 weeks or 18 months? I think I already know, but uh, looking forward to a couple weeks from now. I'll say more about that at the end of the service, but again, thank you so much for staying connected with us as best we can uh, during these days. If you have a Bible near you, open it up to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're continuing our series called Change. Justin did a great job last week in the book of Galatians. If you didn't get the message from last week, I want to encourage you to take some time and tune into that this week. And as he called us to the crucified life and asked the question, in what ways are, is Jesus calling us to die to ourself and to experience the kind of change that's available in Him. And this morning, I want to pick it up in John chapter 4. Well, the Simpson family, we just returned from Sanibel Island, had a great week down in Florida. It's plenty hot in uh, Florida this time of year, but we had a great time getting away, beach, pool, sun, all the the good fun that that provides. And uh, I think it was the second day we were there. Um, it's not really a Simpson family vacation until I lose my sunglasses, so, or I break my sunglasses. So if you ask our girls or you ask Kendra, they'll say, yeah, it's at least one pair every vacation. So it was like the second day we hit this beach on Captiva Island. The waves were a little bit stronger there. So we were out doing some boogie boarding, and sure enough, a wave came over, just swallowed up the sunglasses, and, you know, away they washed, and I, you know, did the feeble attempt at trying to find them, and which was an effort in futility. So... That same day on the beach, the wind had inverted our uh, beach umbrella, and in mid-July in southern Florida, uh, it's important to have a beach umbrella, right? So at the end of this day, uh, we got back to the condo, we showered up, we ate, and I said, hey, let's, let's try to head into town, and let's hit the Walmart, we can get a beach umbrella, dad can get some sunglasses, and so we're driving in there, and we get there, I think it was like... 8.28 8.28 we pull in. I didn't even think that Walmart would be closing at 8.30, but sure enough, we walk up, Walmart's closed. Outstanding. So we ask, where's another option? Target down the road. We go into Target. Of course, they don't have any beach umbrellas, et cetera, et cetera. At this point, I'm too tired to deal with the sunglass selection, so I just pass on that. And so we're leaving Target And I felt like I knew my way around that area well enough because if you know the Santa Bay Island area, area, there's only one major causeway bridge uh, from the main section over to Sanibel. And so I thought, I, th- I think I kind of know where I'm at. And so I head out. I don't do the GPS thing. I feel like I've got a good sense of where we're going and I'm cruising down. And yeah, you know where the story's going probably, right? So I, I, <laughs> I'm going along and I look around, I go, that doesn't look very familiar, and that doesn't look very familiar, and hmm. 
About that time, I don't know which of the girls in the back seat said, Dad, do you know where we are? And inside of me, I said, I don't really think I do. No, I'm not sure. I think what I said was, I'm not sure, but I'm working on it. And at this point, because it had been a long day, and I was plenty frustrated at that point, and I was just wanting to get back to the condo, and now we're lost. Even though I was pretty convinced I knew the way, I ended up I didn't quite know the way. So this gets at a term in the New Testament that I put in your notes, and kind of a a theme for the morning is centered around this one word. Say it with me, meta-noel. Say that in your home, meta Noel, and it means in your notes, it's, the, it's translated the English word repent, but it literally means to change one's mind or to turn around. That's what meta Noel means. And if you hang around Jesus for any length of time, you're going to find out He's going to invite you into a consistent experience of meta Noel. He's going to ask you to change your mind about something. He's going to ask you to change your perspective, change your view, shift your thoughts. Even though you might feel deeply about something, even though you maybe have come to a conclusion where you're absolutely convinced you're right, you know the way, Jesus is going to come and a consistent experience is going to be meta Noel. Hey, I need you to change your mind about that. I need you to shift your perspective. I need you to have a wider view. I need you to shift some things around. And that's the setting and the scene we have here in John chapter 4. He's in an encounter with a Samaritan woman at a well, and their dialogue gives us some insight into how this process of repentance and change works. And here's the question I want to set before us this morning. Where in your life these days is Jesus coming to you and saying, I think that needs to change a little bit. I'd like you to shift your thoughts here. I'd like you to open up to a new perspective there. I'd like you to step back and maybe evaluate your view on this or that. Circumstance, situation, person. Where is Jesus coming to you, coming to me, coming to us and say, I want you to change your mind about that. Well, John chapter 4, verse 5, here's the storyline. So, Jesus comes to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So, sixth hour would be translated noon. So, sun is at its peak. Here's a map geographically where Jesus is. So, He's going from the south, He's going from south Judea up to Galilee, and He has to pass through an area called Samaria. So, you can see it's a bit of a journey, and He's going through a territory that most often the Jews would have avoided. And the backdrop here with Samaritans is the Samaritans were seen as kind of a contaminated bloodline. They were known as kind of half-breeds. And the reason is they had Jewish roots, but back in 722 B.C. when Assyria came in and ransacked Jerusalem, took a bunch of Jews captive, scattered them all over the face of that area of the known world, and kept a small remnant behind, well, the Assyrians brought in a bunch of foreign nations with them, and eventually the small group of Jews that were left behind from that occupation, they intermarried with not only the Assyrians but other neighboring nations. And that intermarried group, Samaritans. So, the Jews' view of the Samaritans were they didn't stay true to their pure Jewish bloodlines. They saw them as kind of straying outside the lines. They saw them as less than fully human. They saw that it was to the point where they, a Jew wouldn't allow the shadow of a Samaritan to touch them because they believed the shadow would contaminate them. So, there was a lot of racial hostility 
going on here. And Jesus goes right through Samaria, a Jewish man trafficking through Samaria, and now going to a well that he would have known would have been occupied primarily by women. So now here's a Jewish man in Samaria speaking to a Samaritan woman at noon at a well. And the setting is, here's a picture of what the well would look like. So it would be a covered space. That's why he would talk about it would be a place for them to get a little bit of rest because the well would be quite deep, so they would work the, the rope and the bucket system, and it would be covered. It would be a place where they would take a rest as well as gather the water. So Jesus goes to this space, and church, I want you to see how he, he, he moves towards the gender inequalities. He moves towards the racial injustice. He moves towards the prejudice and the biases that are there. I want you to see how he moves toward all of that space. Because in Jesus' day, here's the kind of the pecking order of the day. It was like Jewish man, Jewish woman, Jewish children, Samaritan man, Samaritan woman. Do you see the gap from Jewish man to Samaritan woman, and he's moving towards all that, and he wants to bring some change. He's bringing a meta-noel discussion. He's like, hey, I, I want to change your perspective on some things here, specifically at this well. Let's watch what happens here. Verse 7, when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, that's important because the disciples would have been freaking out about Jesus doing this because, again, they're Jewish men. And notice what the text says here, verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Notice the parentheses that John inserts. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So, in the midst of all of the racial upheavals going on in our world today, we can see that since Genesis 3, since humans have been on the planet, there's been this tendency to uh, categorize, to begin to isolate and distance, to begin to classify, and in this form, prejudices and biases towards people. In this case of Jesus' day, Jews don't associate with Samaritans. They just don't do it. And Jesus wants to bring Meta Noel to that. Yeah, I want to change your perspective on that. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew, circle in your Bibles, the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Notice the phrase gift, if you knew the gift of God. Now, a gift is something you have to receive. You don't earn a gift. You earn a wage. You receive a gift. Grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Jesus is a gift. Living water is a gift. It is a gift to be received. And I wonder if someone's tuning in today and they're tuning in to hear this message that maybe in your relationship with God, you've been trying to work and achieve and accomplish something that at this core, Jesus says to you, actually, you got to move from achiever to receiver. Because what I want to give you, it's a gift. And you simply open up your hands, you open up your heart, you open up your mind, and in this case, you're going to have to do a little meta-Noel work. You have to change your perspective because I want to give you something. Receive. Receive this. In order to receive, she's going to have to shift. She's going to have to change her view about some things, and specifically now, He's going to get into it, verse 10, or verse 11. He's, she says, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? So you see, she's preoccupied with well water for the body understandably so. She's at a well. She's preoccupied with the physical water for the physical body. And Jesus, as he often does, is taking the physical setting and he's drawing attention to the spiritual reality. So she's preoccupied with well water for the body. Jesus is speaking about living water for her soul. And in that space right there is where he's bringing a space of, you're going to have to change your mind. 
You're going to have to meta Noel, a repent, a turning to some things in order for her to receive what Jesus is trying to lead her to receive. In other words, she can't stay deeply entrenched in the views and the perspectives and the conclusions that she's always had. She may have been raised with them, taught about them since she was this high. She may have had all kind of cultural realities pressed upon her. They may, they may have been systems set up to reinforce the distance that she should have about this Jewish man and what he's… All of that stuff, she's going to have to have a level of humility now to begin to engage and to receive something. And now watch what happens. Jesus answers, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, pointing to the well water. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So you see this? Jesus is drawing attention to a condition. It's not just a Bible thing. This is a human thing. A human thing is to be human is to live with a thirst so deeply embedded that the water of Jacob's well could never satisfy. Hear that again. There is a thirst inside the human condition that the waters of this world, the waters of Jacob's well could never satisfy. The depth of the thirst is intended to drive us to the living water of Jesus' grace. That's why it's an unquenchable thirst at Jacob's well. That's why you can't squeeze living water out of your career. As hard as you work, as high as you climb, you can't squeeze living water out of it. It won't satisfy that. No matter how big your 401k is, you can't squeeze living water out of that 401k. No matter how wonderful your spouse is, you can't squeeze living water out of a marriage. No matter how great your kids are, you can't squeeze living water out of your kids. No matter how, how amazing it is to serve God in ministry at some point, whatever ministry accomplishments you may have, you can't squeeze living water out of the work of the ministry. It's this unquenchable thirst inside the human soul that won't allow the well waters of this world to satisfy because Jesus is trying to drive us to this living water of His grace. Do you see that? And I wonder if somebody's listening today and, man, you've been, you've been digging deep in Jacob's well. And maybe you've been busting your tail to try to deal with some brokenness and some things in here, but you just keep going deeper and deeper at Jacob's well. And Jesus is like, hey, at what point are you going to meta Noel on this? At what point are you going to say, you know what? Maybe I need to rethink this. Maybe I need to change my view Maybe I need to change my perspective. Maybe I need to change my mind. Maybe I need to shift from drilling deeper at Jacob's well. Maybe I need to open up and receive the gift of living water at Jesus' well. And to bring that level of change is going to require a humility, a willingness to step back because sometimes those beliefs are pretty deeply entrenched. And sometimes the systems around us reinforce that entrenchment. And so do you see the massive act of grace that repentance is? Like when you get to the point in your life when you actually do change your mind about something, man, that's a gift of grace. And if, it's not, if it hasn't happened in a while, it probably should be a bit alarming to us if we're living life with Jesus and his way and our way haven't been colliding at some point, there's probably a regular collision between our way and God's way happening pretty consistently because we're fallen, because we're involved in a world that reinforces the wrong values and ideas that we probably internalize some things and we call it our way and we feel really strongly about it and we're pretty deeply entrenched in it. And then Jesus comes and meets us at a well and he says, yeah, I see your way and I'm bringing my way colliding with your way. And at that point, church, wisdom is choose Meta Noel. Be willing to change your mind and say, I want to see this a little more like you see it, Jesus, because I think I'm a little skewed in all of 
this. So I love the quote. I put it in your notes here. Reverend Horace Bushnell, he was in the 1800s pastoring. He says, I've moved from the agony of questions I cannot answer to the agony of answers I cannot escape. Yeah, that's it right there. And so as the chapter unfolds here, the Samaritan woman, she moves to the space of changing her mind. She becomes a follower of Jesus. Now, as the dialogue goes on, and you can read the full chapter later if you'd like, she's had five failed marriages, and she's with a live-in boyfriend now, attempting to maybe cultivate her sixth. But here's the point. She recognizes maybe the the well water she was digging down for, the dissatisfaction of five failed marriages and now a live-in boyfriend, and nothing was working. She realizes, you know what? Maybe I need to abandon. I need to change my mind, and maybe I need to listen to this Jewish man. He's offering living water something I've not heard about before. And she receives it. She becomes a Christian. She becomes a follower of Jesus. Some things begin to be healed in her life. She begins to have her eyes opened up. She changes her mind. She changes her view. She changes her perspective. Some things begin to change in her life. And just like what happens when someone genuinely experienced Jesus, they begin to share that with the people around them. Because she's had a little different encounter at the well than an average noonday run to the well was. And so she goes back to her Samaritan village, and she begins to tell everyone around her about what's happened. And that's where we're going to draw things together here. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Look what she said. He told me everything I ever did because she didn't tell him about the five marriages that failed and the live-in boyfriend. Jesus told her about it. And that would be a little alarming, right? He's been reading her mail. So she's like, hey, he told me everything. He didn't tell her everything she ever did, but she got the picture like, he knows me in a way no one else really knows. Isn't that amazing about Jesus? Do you know Jesus knows you in ways that no one else does? And he sees some things that no one else sees. Even you yourself don't see. That's Jesus. He sees into that space. And she's like, I met a man who's just different than any other man I've met. And I had a dialogue that's different than the other dialogue. And I tasted some water that's different than any other water. And that's just not available to her. Because look what happens here. So when the Samaritans came to him, to Jesus, they urged him to stay with them. Are you kidding me? And he stayed two days. What's ironic about that? Wait a minute, where is she? She's in a Samaritan village, a Samaritan village urging a Jewish man not to get out of town, but to stay for two days. Are you kidding me? Look at the ripple effect of one act of repentance. You never know the ripple effect from one, just one. One humble response of Meta Noel. One willingness to change your mind. Look at what's happening here. A Samaritan village is having a Jewish man stay over for two days. In verse 41, and because of his many words, more became believers. And then verse 42, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Church, do you see the power in that statement? How is it that this Samaritan village understands that Jesus is who he said he was? Not just having a personal encounter with Jesus, it's having a personal encounter with the Samaritan woman who drank his living water. They saw the glory of Jesus through one of his followers who was willing to humble herself, to shift her views, to experience Meta Noel, to repent and turn and go a new way and receive his living water, abandon the well water of Jacob's place and to move into living water of Jesus' well. She was willing to do that. And because of that, look at all that's changed. Are you kidding me? The amount of change that's occurring right here in this chapter And this is a window into the way Jesus changes stuff. There comes a point when our way collides with his way. And when that happens, meta noel. There's got to be a repentance. There's got to be a willingness to change our mind, to change our views, to humble ourselves and say, you know what? Maybe Maybe I need to rethink that. Maybe that conclusion I've had about that person or that circumstance or that situation, maybe that just, that's just wrong. That's not how Jesus would want me to see it. Maybe I need to be open to changing. And because of her willingness to do that, look at all that's happened. A Samaritan village 
they've changed their mind about Jesus. The disciples who come back from town, they now change their mind about the Samaritans. Do you see all this? And then all the people rippling out from that saying, well, maybe the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Samaritan, maybe in Jesus' name that's supposed to come down, which is what Ephesians 2 talks about. In Christ, He removes the dividing wall of hostility between peoples. In Jesus, it's only through the living water of His grace that can happen. And that usually stems from a long period of beliefs and conclusions and systems that are set up to reinforce it. And and Jesus isn't hindered by that. He's not intimidated by that. He moves right towards it. He moves towards the cultural barriers. He moves towards the racial inequalities. He moves towards the gender inequity, and He moves towards it all. And He says, I've got a new way for you guys to think about this, but it's going to require meta Noel. And so, church, I, ha- I can't help but wonder, as a country right now, could it be that one of the things God's doing in 2020 with our nation, and maybe not just our nation, could it be the nations of the world? Could it be that God is calling out to the nations of the world to change their mind about some things? The Meta Noel. To step back and shift our view, have a little different perspective to be open to change. Could it be that God is coming to the United States of America and to other nations of the world in the midst of everything else He's shifting around? Could it be saying, would you be open to change your mind? Because some of the ways you've been viewing, some of the conclusions you have, some of the beliefs that you feel so strongly about, in Jesus' name, they're just wrong. And they need to change. And if we'll be willing with a level of humility to move toward him in this, I think we'll experience what the Samaritan woman experienced. There's living water at his well that the wells of this world would never be able to offer. In fact, the only way we're going to see the systems of this world change is if we join that Samaritan woman at Jesus' well. We receive his living water, and then we offer that to a very thirsty world around us. That's how systems change. That's how the dividing wall of hostility comes down. There's not some new program. There's not going to be some new institution formed. There's not going to be, it's going to happen when individuals like you and me and others all around the world say, I I see my ways. I recognize some things I feel deeply about. And Jesus is coming to me. And his way and my way are colliding. And right here, I've got a choice. Meta Noel. Am I going to change my mind? Am I going to let Jesus' views and Jesus' ways and Jesus' perspective and Jesus' heart begin to reshape mine? And church, I think that's what our nation needs. I think that's what our world needs. I think that's what our church needs. I think that's what I need. And perhaps it's not just on a global scale. Perhaps it's really personal for you this morning. Maybe this morning you feel like you're, you're that Samaritan woman. Maybe you just tuned into a live stream because it's what you do on Sunday morning. And you find out Jesus kind of unexpectedly showed up this morning. And he's confronting some things maybe in your heart under your own roof. And he's saying, I need you to change your mind about that. I need you to shift your view on that. I need you to change your conclusion. Maybe there's a pattern of things that's been going on in hiddenness. Jesus sees it. Jesus knows, and he's moving towards you. And he's saying, hey, are you willing to set down the bucket out of Jacob's well? Are you willing to set that aside? And are you willing now to receive the gift of living water that comes from his well? Are you willing to? Worship team's going to come back up. We're going to do a closing song this morning, so don't run off. And if you're kind of distracted now with cooking preparations for lunch and all that, could you just pause the kitchen prep process and maybe set aside whatever the other distractions are going on around you? And would you just settle in with me for a few minutes here? And 
I just want you to reflect on where is Jesus coming to you this morning and saying, I'd like you to change your mind about that. I know how strongly you feel about it. I know why you've landed on the conclusions you've landed on. And yet, this morning, by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is coming and saying, would you change? Would you shift? Would you move? Would you be open to a new way and a new direction? So that night uh, on Sanibel, we're trying to get back to the condo. We left Target. I'm lost. Girls say, Dad, do you know where we are? I'm not sure I know where I am. So I say to him, though I am pretty frustrated. I am pretty frustrated, right? And uh, I say, can somebody just fire up Google Maps? So fire up Google Maps. Put the address of the condo in. Cruising down the road. They put the address of the condo in and they hit go. And do you know what the voice from Google Maps says? In 300 feet, make a U-turn. Dads, please tell me I'm not the only one who's been here. In 300 feet, make a U-turn. Outstanding. I think it was Lily or Kalen from the back seat that showed the map showed, Dad, we're going the wrong way. Yep, I know. But just five minutes before, I was convinced I knew the right way back to Sanibel. In 300 feet, make a U-turn. Where's the voice of the Spirit calling out this morning, church? Where are you hearing that? Turn around. Shift your perspective. Change your mind. Meta Noel. Let the words of this song help reinforce that space. Just let the team just kind of sing this over you and sing this into your soul. And then at the conclusion of the song, I'm going to come up and lead us in a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Just take a moment now and wherever you're at, just bow your heads and close your eyes. If the kids are all around you, see if you can get them to settle down with you for a moment here. And just say, Jesus, are you calling me to change my mind? Or is the voice of the Spirit saying to you, that needs to change. I know how strongly you feel. I know how you got there, but it needs to change. Would you just open that up to him? Maybe right now just confess all the ways you've been drilling deep in Jacob's well, searching for water that honestly you know is it's not satisfying. Just confess it. Just say, Lord, I've been working so hard to try to figure this out on my own. And then just turn right now from that achiever posture, turn to this receiver and maybe just open up your hands. Turn your palms up and say, Jesus, I just want to receive the living water from your well. Just receive it. It's a gift he wants to give. Grace is a gift. Salvation's a gift. Living water's a gift. Jesus is a gift. He just wants to give to you. Just receive now. Just agree with that song we were singing that nothing else, nothing else is, nothing else will do. Fill us with the living water of your spirit, we pray. And then Jesus, we just call out collectively for our nation. We lift up our country to you. We lift up the, the leadership, so many who are working tirelessly. And we pray you'd fill them with wisdom, and that they would seek you, that they would humble themselves before you, that all the ways you may be coming to us as a country and to the nations of the world and saying, this needs to change. I pray for a mighty movement of your spirit to bring repentance, Lord. That as a country, would we have a heart of repentance for the things that need to change. 
you bless us with a gift of humility to receive that? A teachable spirit. Would you remove the dividing wall of hostility between groups of people? It's just simply been there too long. So, Spirit of the living God, have your way. I pray for a mighty outpouring of your Spirit on our land. And perhaps the first movement of the Spirit these days is a movement of repentance. Meta Noel. Pray you bring revival to our world and bring revival to our land and bring revival to our hearts. change what you want to change. We simply open up to you. Have your way. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.